disorders, they're called, and they're sort of very, um, tend to be kind of inflexible personality traits that come from within over a long period of time. So it's different sometimes from things like anxiety, which may result from circumstances around you at times. Um, a personality disorder is more entrenched. It can be very difficult to, um, to, to kind of cure, if you want to use that word, but borderline would be somewhere between kind of mm. what they used to call neuroses and sort of psychotics. It's somewhere in On the edge that. of neuroses Which, and psychoses, on the border. Yes, ex- exactly, on the border. And she struggled with everything from loneliness to insecurities to sort of a, a real lack of identity. Um, in her day, there was no good treatment. And, and even today, a lot of uh, borderline uh, personality disorder patients are seen as sort of toxic because they're so difficult um, to treat because they don't always want to be treated um, and they don't always engage in therapy. But now there are new forms of therapy that can be extremely helpful. That can help for them, borderline. Um, ide- yes, they they in, you know instead of just sitting in this awful past that they might have had, they deal with that, they accept that, but they also learn skills and coping mechanisms to have fruitful lives, and they can. I- I think you said something really, really important when you just said that about the past and about coping mechanisms. And I wonder how much of these, all of these different personality disorders, if you will, from autism to depression to bulimia uh, to borderline, how much of these are responses to childhood trauma or childhood experiences? And in your, without, without blaming the victim or any of that stuff or, or blaming somebody's past, in your experience and in your research, have you found that there is a, uh, that there's a significant or important relationship between what happens to a kid when they're very, very young and the development of these personality disorders? Well, but, I mean, there can be a, a significant connection in some cases. And just to be clear on the personality disorders are a whole category of mental health um, disorders, and they're separate from these others, like mood disorders would be anxiety and depression, for example. Um, but, you know, they all, um, they're, they're all somewhat different and they and they manifest in different ways in terms of childhood um, impact so if you have if you lose a parent young they have studied this and, and know that it can affect later development of depression or anxiety um, but at the same time there is um, lots of research going on into brain science what are the genes involved with all of these different conditions they're discovering new genes for autism every single day they're doing brain scans on depression and they're finding ways to identify depression even in kids who haven't even developed Developed it yet? Um, they're starting to look at hormones and whether they could do tests to, to distinguish um, differences in hormone levels. So there's all sorts of um, assessment going on in terms of the science. So even though you, you you could be somebody who lost a parent young, for example, if you take that example and do just fine in life, it doesn't necessarily dictate right. the course. But you could also be somebody who has the right combination, or in some cases, the wrong combination of genes and environment that does lead you down this path. So trauma itself or, or adverse experiences don't necessarily mean that you're going to go into any of these disorders, whatever you want to call them, but, but the reverse. Do you find that it's possible that somebody could just become, could develop these disorders spontaneously in adulthood or, you know, spontaneously after they've already developed and after the, all of the childhood experiences would have occurred that did not occur? Can you spontaneously as an adult become bulimic, for example? Well, I think um, there's all sorts of unknowns about how something like that would develop suddenly in adulthood, but it certainly can. I think then when you see somebody who develops bulimia, and a lot of these do manifest as as adults, you go back and look and see what are the triggers that might have been there, um, both environmentally, which could be a childhood experience, as well as is anything going on that we can identify now genetically. So, I mean, depression can, can come at any point, for example. It doesn't necessarily... Um, it often comes, say, in your 20s, but it could, could come later. Um, so there's no rhyme or reason sometimes to specifically when or why these conditions develop. That's, that's a big mystery for a lot of people, and that's what scientists are trying to understand. Have you ever heard of this thing called the ACE study, Ad- Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? I'm not sure I've heard of that specifically. I know there's a lot of work going on in adverse childhood. Um, adverse and I know childhood. It can affect brain development and affect all sorts of levels of, of development and growth. And it's, it's such a um, rich area to study. So how did you come up with these 12? What, I mean, you had to weed people out, I'm sure. And who did you weed out? I did. I weeded <laughs> who who out didn't make the book wasn't sick enough to make the cut or, <laughs> or wasn't twisted um, enough well, to make the cut? 
I know. There, well, there are a lot of people who it was almost too complicated. To, Mozart is somebody who's been diagnosed with a zillion things, including Tourette syndrome. And oh wow, um, Tourette's. Yeah, was he schizophrenic? Was yeah. Mozart schizophrenic? I noticed there's no I, schizophrenics I here. No, there isn't. I, I, I worked. I actually looked very carefully for that. Um, schizophrenia is such a complicated and, and difficult. Um, condition and I couldn't in many cases I couldn't find a confirmed case that I was sure of because a lot of I was I was looking at people who are no longer alive for a whole whole variety of reasons I couldn't find a really good solid case of somebody in the past because so often the diagnosis wasn't a pro wasn't it wasn't they were just crazy condition wasn't they didn't know they they just called you nuts what it was yeah Yeah. Yeah. or it was misdiagnosed as something else so it was difficult to find somebody good I did. I, I'm a pharmacist. I did psychiatric pharmacy for when I was a, in, oh. uh, when I first graduated college, and uh, so I worked with a lot of schizophrenics. And I'm telling you, they were the most brilliant, creative, uh, just just uh, uh, artistic. Had this sense of art, art of art where they could make connections that didn't exist in, for normal people in their words and in their in their drawings and in their thoughts. And I was found it to be the most fascinating of all the mental disorders. And I'm sure throughout history there must have been some brilliant, brilliant schizophrenics. Um, we're at, we're almost yeah. out of time, but I, Claudia, I wonder if you could just tell us, give, people who are dealing with these kinds of issues, give, them, give us like some words of inspiration. What would you say from your research? How would you inspire people who are dealing with something that they may think is some kind of weird dysfunction that they're embarrassed of or they're traumatized by? Oh, I would just, I mean, for starters, we're all connected. We all struggle with these issues, whether it's us, our friends, our family, everybody around us. That's the mind and the brain are so complicated, so wonderful. They give us incredible um, triumphs and also challenges. But there, you get the help you need. Be, be brave. Go out there. Ask for help. Go see somebody. Talk to people, um, and you know, gather your strength to do that because you come out the other end and accomplish extraordinary things and have a really satisfying life. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate it very much. And your book is available, obviously, uh, everywhere: Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, all the regular places. Do you have a website? I'm working on getting that right up. It's ClaudiaKalb.com, and I'm on Twitter at Claudia Kalb. And there's lots of good stuff that Claudia's written on the Internet. If you just Google Claudia Kalb, C-A-L-B. Uh, it's been awesome. Thank you so K-A-L-B. much. The book is K-A-L-B, Claudia Kalb. Andy Warhol, <laughs> Andy Warhol was a hoarder inside the minds of history's great personalities. Thanks so much for coming on, Claudia. Appreciate it very much. Thanks. I so enjoyed being here. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. All right. All right. That's all the time we have for today on The Bright Side. Andy Warhol was a horror. That was super interesting. Tomorrow we'll continue talking about inflammation, and we'll talk about essential fats, and we'll talk about strategies for cleaning the blood, and then uh, we'll get into the lymph. I'm really excited about that because uh, nobody talks about the lymph. We certainly don't talk about it in the medical community as much as we should, even in the alternative health community as much as we should. Check out my uh, skincare blog, truthtreatments.com, and check out our truth treatment products, and also criticalhealthnews.com, pharmacistben.com, and brightsideben.com if you're interested in checking out the Longevity products. And that's it. We'll talk to you all tomorrow. Have yourselves a beautiful, spectacular, wonderful day.